Hello everyone and welcome back to the Color Spotlight series. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at Nickel Azo Yellow. Also going by the name of Transparent or Translucent Yellow in some brands, Nickel Azo Yellow is made from PY150. It is an interesting and popular color of yellow that is also widely used today in the production of the new quinacridone gold hues. PY150 is a very light, fast, transparent color that does not granulate. It is rated as moderately staining by just about everything I could find, but honestly, in my personal experience, I would call this a very highly staining yellow, and I'll get to that a little bit later. The hue of this pigment is interesting, and it appears to be a dull golden brown in its mass tone or in a pan, but it lightens to a very bright, almost cool yellow when you tint it out with water. It should be noted that pigments containing nickel are considered as potential health and environmental hazards since they do contain heavy metal, being the nickel. <laughs> These can accumulate in untreated water. Now, I can't say that I know a lot about nickel toxicity issues as compared to say like the cobalts that we've talked about here on the channel before, but I've known that these are potentially toxic paints and so I've just tended to stay away from them personally in the past. I've only really ventured into learning how to use them more recently when all of you guys showed an interest in them and wanted to see them here on the channel. I have acquired a couple versions of PY150 in sets or as samples from viewers, so let's go ahead and take a look at what I do have. I have four brands to show you here today. The first is from Core, and the only one that I have in a tube form, although the swatch here was painted from a dried pan. It came from one of their introductory sets and is a very vibrant version of this color, and it has the deepest mass tone of the whole group, being closest to that golden brown I talked about earlier. When looking at the sample, it's easy to see why this pigment is used in quinacridone gold hues as it shares many characteristics. Next is from Daniel Smith, and this sample came to me from a viewer in a half pan. This is a clear, bright, and beautiful version of this color. It glazes nicely, but it doesn't seem to get quite as deep as the mass tone of the core version, which may or may not be a benefit for the color that you are specifically looking for. The White Knights version is similar in hue to Daniel Smith, but if you look at it closely, it doesn't glaze quite as well and doesn't look quite as clean. Last up is Mission Gold, and they call theirs Green Gold, which is actually more common of a name of a pigment that we're going to be taking a look at next in the Color Spotlight series. This sample came to me from a viewer on a generously sized dot chart, so it's the smallest amount of paint that I have to work with, but it was still a large enough sample to accurately swatch several times. You'll notice here that I actually have two swatches. The first one in line with the other samples here was painted on the same day that I took this picture. Its hue lies somewhere between the Daniel Smith and Core samples, and it looks like a pretty nice version of this color. However, I also have a swatch from a while ago. It was at least a year ago, but I don't know when exactly from when I first got this dot card to try out. You should be able to see that the second glaze is quite green in color. I don't remember it being like this when I first swatched it, but it could have been my air. I don't know if it was dirty water or if it's been like this for some time and just changed over time while I was sitting in the binder. It is a weird thing that happened, so I did want to go ahead and re-swatch it just to make sure. I suppose only time will tell with the second swatch that I did if it changes again, and I can check on that later. If you guys are watching this video more than like six months after it comes out, be sure to comment down below and remind me to give a look and I'll report back. Now it's time for the color mixing portion of this video. As always, if you'd like to see a more complete tutorial on how I mix these type of varying swatches, I'll link a tutorial I did in the past so that you can go ahead and see what that looks like. Finding diverse and helpful color mixes was actually a little bit difficult this time around, but only because we've used this color so much throughout this season of Color Spotlight for other colors. I already mentioned that this color is a crucial component of the new quinacridone gold mixes with PO48, which I showed off in the quinacridone burnt orange episode. It also mixes beautifully with reds to create fiery oranges and a wide array of blues to make gorgeous earthy greens. All of that being said, the first color combo that I have for you is perhaps not a very common color, but one that I really, really love, and that is PBR25. Permanent Brown from Daniel Smith or Red Brown from Mission Gold is a gorgeous red-brown color that when mixed with Nickel Azo Yellow creates a lovely range of golden colors. These colors are quite similar to Quinacridone Gold with some fluctuation on either end of the spectrum. 
Next, I decided to use a nearly red version of an orange that I have called Transparent Pyrrole Orange by Daniel Smith. This pigment is PO71, and these two colors together create a variety of bright oranges, ranging from a new gamboge type of color in the yellow-orange region to a middle azo orange type of hue, and even to the darker range of oranges more closely resembling cadmium orange. I cannot stress how much I love this next color combo. I typically choose single pigment colors for this mixing segment of Color Spotlight, but the Rose of Ultramarine combines so beautifully with the Nickel Asso Yellow to produce a wide range of browns, ranging from a rich middle brown to a more luscious dark brown. All of these colors granulate because of the Ultramarine that is present inside of the Rose of Ultramarine, and the PV19 gives it a nice warm glow. For the blue mixture, since we already saw it with anthraquinone blue and cobalt teal earlier in the series, I went ahead and used good old ultramarine. These two colors create a wide range of mossy, sappy greens to more muted, deeper teals. All in all, you can't really go wrong when you're mixing any blue with this color yellow. They all do a fantastic job. Wrapping up the mixing portion of this video, I have two very different versions of single pigment greens to show you. First up is Thalo Green Yellow Shade, PG36. And while I don't have this color on my palette either, and I don't really use these fluorescent greens in my own personal work, I know a lot of you guys really love them, so I wanted to go ahead and show them off so you can see how much they glow from the paper. Finally, we have Perlene Green, which is a deep, almost black version of green that when mixed with the PY150, creates some of the most gorgeous warm greens I have ever seen. I know that's a very short summary of these two colors together, but I don't know what else to say about them other than they're just really, really stunning. As usual for the Color Spotlight series, we're finishing off this mixing page with some of the pigment property demonstrations. First up is the Wet into Wet Wash. I do apologize that the water was slightly tinted green from the prior two rows of mixing. I do want to stress again, as I mentioned in the intro, that I find PY150 to be in a very invasive color that likes to latch onto the other colors it's mixed with and keep them around for a long time. My brush is easily stained when I'm using this color and it takes much longer than usual to clean them out. Next test here is a glaze, which I feel it does okay, but not quite as cleanly as I would expect it to for a transparent and staining color. I feel like the second glaze is a little bit splotchy, and while that would improve on a cotton paper, I still feel like it should have been a little bit easier to achieve here on the cellulose paper as well. Following that is the lifting test, and I just don't understand how this color is not rated as highly staining. This is cellulose paper, and I could barely lift any pigment off at all. The paper is still deeply stained yellow after several attempts. Finally, we have the softening off where I show you my typical painting technique of laying down the pigment on dry paper and then softening off the edge with clean water. You can see here how there's a bit of an edge where I did soften it off, but otherwise it's okay. Alrighty, so the last time around I painted that beautiful red beta fish or beta corn and I really don't know how I'm supposed to top that. It's probably one of my favorite pieces I've ever done and definitely a hard act to follow, so instead I just decided to have fun with this one. I had several ideas bouncing around in my head for what subject to pick for this one. I was going to do a yellow spotted seahorse because it would show off the color really well, but I've painted a lot of seahorses before. I even have one here on the channel and I feel figured I might not be pushing myself far enough with that idea. I ended up choosing instead a Keel Build Toucan as my inspiration. The proportions of this bird made me smile every time I looked at them, and I felt like I could get a lot of the colors that I needed for the different shades of the beak by mixing them with the nickel as a yellow. In the early sketches, I had a typical unicorn just stuck on top of their heads, but honestly, I just feel like I am being so uncreative with my incorporations of this theme, and I wanted to do better. I remember that I worked at a zoo in college that had rhinoceros hornbills, which are these huge, magnificent-looking birds, and although they're, you know, up in the trees, they've got these giant beaks and these, I mean, they're just really cool. And so I decided to go ahead and draw on those rhinoceros hornbills for the inspiration for the horn aspect of this painting. 
The fact that they are similar looking birds, meaning the hornbills and the toucans, it definitely helped in the integration of these two concepts. And so it wasn't like too crazy out of the box, but I'm definitely happier with this than I was with just the standard pointy unicorn horn. I hope that you guys enjoy them too and have fun watching this come together. Before I go, I just wanted to let you guys know that I might have to space out my uploads for the next couple of weeks or so. My health is better, yay, um, but I do have a lot of really crucial deadlines coming up and I need some extra time to work on those projects. I really wish that I could share with you in real time kind of what I'm working on and all the details about them here on the channel, but I can't, so just trust me that they will all come to light in due time over the next couple of months. What I can tell you is I am about halfway through my first Skillshare class that is going to be on color mixing and pigment properties. I'm super, super excited for that. I'm also working on some secret collaborations. AAC is just around the corner once again on September 13th. And in general, I just have some really fun things planned over the next couple of months. So if you guys want to keep up to date with me, be sure to follow me over on Instagram where I am most active at in liquid color or head on over to Patreon for more real time tutorials and additional content that I post over there. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed the content, comment down below and let us know your favorite way to use PY150 and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more watercolor content in the future. I'm wishing you all my best and until next time, happy painting.